um, that over the years, my Cajun accent, I haven't lost it. If I talk about my mom, you will hear it. But it has, my accent has been a bit neutralized. So apologies in advance. Um, well, it is awesome to be with you. I'm so happy. I've been very much looking forward to this. Um, Missy, if you're here, could you could you find me a Bible? Just get it to me at some point. So, contrary to maybe popular belief, I wasn't born a nun. <laughs> so my mama's name is Ethel. So it's not like he came up to my mama, you know, in, in the delivery room and said, Miss Ethel, you have a baby nun. <laughs> oh, perfect. It's from the Pauline Wikimedia Center. <laughs> awesome. I am, I'm very, very grateful for my vocation. I'm very grateful to God for the way he has been a part of my life. And I will kind of share some aspects of my, my story and my journey with the Lord. But today is really for you. I'm here to, to just sort of open the doors and open the windows and open our hearts and encourage you to do what only the, a woman is the one who is the guardian of her yes. The Lord God has so much esteem and reverence for the feminine heart. And each one of us are invited to go deeper into a relationship with the creator of our existence. But he's a true gentleman. He won't go where he's not invited. So today, as we sort of open this time, I invite each one of you to take a moment, and if you want, you can close your eyes, you can bow your head. But I invite you to go into that sanctuary that is within you the place where you are alone with God. And I invite you to quiet your heart before this mystery of God's presence. And become attentive to God's desire for you. He knocks gently and persistently, but we have to let him in. So I invite you in this holy place. the love of God. Open the door of your being, of your mind, of your will, of your heart, of your very body, to the love of God given to us through the body and blood of Jesus, his Son. and through that expression of their love, the Holy Spirit. So we invite you, Jesus, to come. We say, come, Lord Jesus. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. We welcome you this day to be the director of this retreat. To be the guide and the creator of all the good that we know you invited us here to, to give to us.
And we do all of this knowing that when things get rough or a little too mysterious, that Mary, our Blessed Mother, shows up. And in her quiet, dignified presence, she gently wraps her love around us and shows us that the Father, no matter what the enemy might say, that the Father is good. And so we just take a moment in this holy ground where we've gathered more than two, more than three, in his name, we welcome him in our midst, among us, but above all, in this day, this gift of this day, we personally make that invitation. And so you, in your own way, in your own words, in the silence of that sanctuary, Speak to Jesus and welcome him. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Paul the Apostle, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So how are we feeling today? Pretty good? The weather's pretty nice. So I came from Boston, which is pretty nice over there too now. The uh, trees are starting to bloom, you know, so I've been going on these long walks. We, we live on a hill, and it's always great, you know, I'll go like jerk around our lunch break, and I'll walk, and it's like all downhill. It's wonderful, and I'm just looking at the trees, and all the, all the like, um, bushes, when they bloom, they're actually beautiful. They're like, they're colored little flowers, and I'm looking at the flowers, it's beautiful. And then there's these dogwood trees. They look, almost look like little clouds of, of flowers up in the sky. It's beautiful. Then I have to turn around and go home. <laughs> and it's all uphill. And I'm like, why did I do that? So this, the, the spiritual journey is kind of like that. Sometimes we feel like we're cruising. And then sometimes it's like, what happened? It's all uphill. But I'm here to say today that Mary wants to walk with you. As a mother, as a sister, as a friend, and as the mother of Jesus, who is the one who came and saves us. And as I mentioned before, my journey, you know, I, I had to make a journey. And all of us are on a journey. And a retreat day like this is a real gift that you give it to yourself. Because it's not every day that we can just really, like, sanctify, set aside for a holy purpose. That's what it means whenever you say that we're consecrated women. To be consecrated means to take something that's ordinary, very human, very normal, hopefully, <laughs> and we set that aside for God's purpose. Yesterday I was at the airport and I went to get a sandwich at Panera, and the girl behind the counter goes, what are you wearing? <laughs> and then she goes, do you work for an airline? <laughs> and I was like, I could play with this for 20 years. <laughs> I'm really good. I said, I'm a religious sister. I'm a consecrated woman. And she said, but what? I, I, looked, I looked at you and I thought, she could work for her. I just can't figure out which airline it is. <laughs> and then she said, but then that headpiece got up. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it's a veil. I said, when do women wear veils? She goes, on their wedding day. I was like, exactly. <laughs> See, I get to wear my wedding dress every day. I said, I'm married to the Lord. And so my, my existence and this 
this habit is to remind people that the Lord wants to marry all of us. And her eyes got really big. <laughs> she was like, you want a sandwich? <laughs> my vocation, that wherever I go, wherever it is, whoever I meet, I get to speak and nourish within them the truth that we're all made for God. And so today, you all, all of us, we're going to kind of steep, marinate in that goodness of God, in that presence of God that's always there, always inviting us to know Him more to understand his ways and to follow him as disciples. But sometimes we kind of lose sight of that. And it's like even just the thought of having a relationship with God seems like all uphill. So we're going to ask for God's grace to just kind of remind us what this is about. This is not, today is not about me just telling you things, all these cool stories about God so that you all have information about the Lord. Today is a day where you are to know the Lord for yourself, personally. So it's not, I don't want to just talk about God, but I want you to know God. So that you don't just know things about God. You know the Father. You know Jesus. You know His Son. So, as Father mentioned, I'm a daughter of St. Paul. And we're on veterans in memory. And... Um, when I met the sisters, I was a, a junior in high school, and I did not understand all of the things they were telling me about what their vocation was and what their mission was. But it was so strange. I remember this one thing that I couldn't deny. I felt so much at home with them. Like, I didn't even understand half of what they said, but I felt at home. I felt that I could become who I God had planted seeds in my life to be with them. So I pursued that. I kept visiting them, and God bless them, they kept letting me in the door. And eventually, I professed vows. And our mission in the church is evangelization. So we believe that if St. Paul were alive today, he would take up a microphone, he would be producing books, he would be communicating, he would be using the technology and the means of, of today to share what it meant for him to know Jesus. Because for him, he used the means of his own time. He wrote letters, he spoke, he went to the centers of his culture, of the, of the time where people would gather, and he told them, he spoke about Jesus. And so the beautiful thing is, our sisters, so I live now at the mother house, I live in Boston. And it's beautiful to see that because it's the mother house, it's, it's got a lot of nuns. So we have like 80 nuns there. That's a whole lot of nuns, you know? And, um, and I remember the first time I visited, I was in the chapel and the sisters started to sing. And like, oh. There's something about consecrated women singing to Jesus. It's like happy duty goodness, you know? And I remember it was like the sound kind of soared over me and sort of picked me up in it. And it was just beautiful, such a grace. And so we share our sound through music. We share our reflections through literatures, through books. I'll probably talk about some of the titles there that might help you as, because you hear about something and you get a grace in a moment like this, but that grace needs to be nurtured after. So that's why having some good resources is really important. So many times to, to do the mission, we would travel like St. Paul did. We might live in one place for a while and then we move, or we go and we visit families, or we visit parishes, and we bring a selection of our books. So we were doing that. And we went to um, Salford, Louisiana, and we were staying with a host family. And the family was delightful, mom and dad, and I think they had four kids. And we were sitting down, and uh, 
the mom was finishing up to get us dinner, so we were waiting for that. And I was chatting with dad, and at a certain point, um, their little one, she was about four, her name was Hannah, she kept running in the room, looking at me, and then running away. And I was like, oh boy, I can feel a story of a four-year-old girl coming on. So I just kind of sat there and waited, and like I was with family like probably two weeks before that, and I have a three and a half year old, and I was thinking, you know, when a four year old tells a story, like, you know the punchline, like, it's like, oh, and then he threw up. <laughs> and you're supposed to fall over laughing because it's so funny, right? Or she passed out. Or the best one I ever heard was, he got dead. <laughs> so, so at a certain point, Hannah had come in the room like three times. Finally, the third time, Dad was like, Hannah, do you have a story you want to tell sister? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, get ready to laugh, Trace. You know? She said, she looked at him, and then she looked at me, and then she looked at him one last time, and then she looked at me, and she said, my daddy was a drunk. <laughs> And you know how time just sort of stops? <laughs> and I'm looking at Daddy, and I'm thinking to myself, ooh, I bet he wants to get dead, right? <laughs> but the thing was, as I looked at him, looking at her, he didn't do what you would expect. Like, you know, be shocked or he just, he just had this peace. And I could tell, like, yeah. <laughs> He's looking at her like, yeah. And then I look back at her, and she wasn't done. She's like, she's like, my daddy was a drunk, but now he just wants to be a good daddy. And she looked at her daddy. And then she ran away. <laughs> you can't fake good daddy to a four-year-old girl. She knew her daddy. She knew when he was acting like a jerk. And she even knew why. Kids are so perceptive. But then she knew that he was trying and he was changing. And she knew that it was good. So when I talk today about coming to know God for yourself, we want to know the Father as a good dad for myself. Because other people can tell me all the things, right? But unless I encounter God in his goodness to me, it'll just be information. And what, what we're hoping for as time goes on in life is that we can see it for ourselves. I have a good daddy. He's cute. He, um, his name is Gerald. And there's certain things about dad that, so I'm Cajun, as you know from my last name. You can't go more Cajun than Dugan. My, uh, my mom's last name is Savoy. So I'm like 350% Cajun. And my dad, he, um, he always called me by a French term of endearment, like, like dog. But he'd say it in Cajun French, he'd say okay. And he's the best. He will call you something that way forever and be very consistent. But after a while, he gets tired, so he just cuts it in half. So he calls me pull. And like when he was working, he called all of the guys Padna because they, he couldn't remember all their names. Then he just Pod. So they named him Pod to the point where his shirt had Pod as his name. So Dad calls me Cole. And he, he always called me that. And so 
when I entered the community, this was at the time where we were just starting as sisters to have emails. Like we were, you know, early adapters because we're in the media. So we had email, and we had like one community email for the whole community. And one sister would check the email, and then she'd pass out the emails to all the sisters. So one day, she's checking the emails. She has all the sheets printed out. She's like, Sister Maria, Sister Madonna, Sister Francis, who's poop? <laughs> And sure enough, on the top of the page, dear poop. Now, my brother thinks that's hilarious because he's like, you have your own emoji. <laughs> it could look bad. Like, why does your daddy call you poop? Does he love you or not? You know? But the thing is, I know my daddy's heart. He just can't spell. <laughs> but I know he's good. And I think this is strange but true that many times when we look to God and we see the struggles that we're living or we see the struggles of our children or our grandchildren, the pains that people endure, and we look at God and we're like, are you good or not? This is, these days are days in which we can ask him to heal the ways that we maybe see him through the wrong lens. Or we need to be given vision to see the truth. We need his help to open our eyes to his love. So I am very, very excited that today we get to talk about Mary, because Mary had, has taught me so much, and my relationship with Mary has grown over the years. Like, I didn't always understand her, her role. I didn't always understand the Catholic thing about Mary, you know, the rosary and all these different apparitions. I thought as a kid, I thought there was all different ladies. Our Lady of this, Our Lady of that. I thought they were all different ladies. Only it was like the light dawned and I realized, oh my gosh, that's all Mama of Mary? That's all Jesus' Mama? Yes, yes. So today we're going to spend some time just reflecting together on Mary and on her role and how even in her hiddenness, in her silence in many ways, she has so much to offer us. She has so much to teach us. And I have come to know her as a true mother and as a real um, guardian of my heart. She's the one that allowed God's love to define her and also help us to come to know what that love is. So today, we're going to reflect on Mary in the Gospel of John. And that's John chapter 2 and the wedding of Cana. And this is a beautiful story at the very beginning of John's Gospel where Mary probably says the most she says <laughs> at one time. So this is um, John chapter 2, and I'm going to read the passage, um, and we're going to reflect together on God's Word. Now, there's a power in the Word of God. Jesus is really present in his word, and he can speak to us. And so, once again, we have to open our hearts to him. We have to ask him for the grace to open our ears. We want to listen and learn with our heart. So, 
we begin. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servers, Do whatever he tells you. Now, there were six stone water jars there for Jewish ceremonial washings, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told them, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it. And when the head waiter tasted the water that had become wine, without knowing where it came from, although the servers who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves good wine first. And then when the people have drunk freely an inferior wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this as the beginning of his signs in Cana and Galilee, and so revealed his glory. And his disciples began to believe in him. I think everybody in New Orleans knows all about serving the okay wine. And then the good wine. You serve the good wine whenever people have like taste buds. And then after that, it's like, oh, just give whatever. That's water. <laughs> so the context of this story is what? What are we? Where are we? It's a wedding, right? It's a wedding. I love to think of Jesus going to weddings with his mama. That's so good. So good. So human. And if you noticed, the first line was, on the third day. When do we hear about days in scripture? First day, second day. In Genesis, right? The very beginning. Right? And so, in a way, John, at this early stage of his gospel, he's trying to make a connection for us. Because in Genesis, when we're talking about first day, second day, what is God doing? He's creating. He's creating the whole world. And here we are in the gospel of John, and John is saying first day, second day, third day, saying God is doing a new creation. Who in here needs some new creation in your heart? I do. In your mind, the way you see, right? How you love your family, how you love your husband. We all need some recreation, some restoration. So we have hope already that this is what God does. He takes what he's made and he recreates to make us know him and to know his power. So in this, John is teaching us that we're going to have a new creation. And in that new creation, who are the two people in the first creation? Adam and Eve, right? Well, in this new creation, the Lord is perfect providing for us a new Adam and a new Eve. Who would that be? Jesus and Mary. Y'all got your Catholicism down. Good job. So, so we hear in this gospel that Mary is there with Jesus. She, she's there with all the people that are invited at the wedding, and the wine somehow runs out. It fails. And she goes to Jesus and she makes a report, like a good mama would. 
Houston, we have a problem, right? But what I've come to see as I've um, been invited through my vocation to be really a student of God's word is that you don't want to take God's word and go too fast with it. Because we tend to read stuff and we're like, oh, I know that story. Next. And the sisters, even whenever I, I was studying, they were like, slow down, slow down. Because you need to encounter the word with peace and with questions in your heart. You have to let the questions rise up. And one of the things that in reading slowly, in the very first sentence we hear, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Where was the mother of Jesus? There. Y'all, when I read that, I was like, oh my gosh. Mary's already teaching us something. How many times we go somewhere, or we're with people, but we're not with people. We're not with the people we're with. We're with the people we just left. We're like split. Mary was present to where she was. And in our society right now, one easy way for us to be all divided is in our attention. With the, you know, cell phones and we're always looking at our phones. Somebody sent me a video of 1995 of people walking in downtown uh, in New York. They didn't have any cell phones. It was amazing. All their heads were up. It was so weird. Because we're I'm so used to seeing, like I was just in the airport yesterday, and it's like people are walking with their heads down because they always have a screen. And so it's easy to not be present, like in the room where we're at. You know, like when I'm waiting in line, it's so easy to pull my phone out. And the challenge is, can I look at people and scare them and say hello? <laughs> How are you today? They're like, oh my God, what? <laughs> Mary is present to what's right in front of her. And that's an invitation for me and for you. How many of us have a child, a grandchild, someone who we know, we don't even know where they are right now, but our hearts and minds are always preoccupied with them. There is a place for loving our children and being present to them in their suffering. But what are we missing? Who is in front of us that we need to attend to? What is the wisdom that you individually are being invited to at this time? How can you love that strained heart and yet at the same time be present to where you are? so that you can be attentive to maybe the stewardship of your own body, your own health, or the person that you're married to, or whoever it is that you're with at the moment. And I'm not telling you how to do that. I'm, di I'm saying each of us have to discern how is God freeing us from a fixation and inviting us to a love that holds that which is given, but also allows that beloved one to be free? Because picture this, how many times I've had a concerned parent, concerned brother, sister, my own family, I have my own stray hearts that I care about. And I can feel that pull to, to fixate, to grasp, to think, oh, if they could only do this, if they could only do that, oh my gosh, what, 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 will, what will happen if 
to do this, and I get wrapped up in this fear mongering, and believe me, there is an enemy who loves to play with our thoughts. So it starts to run and roll into the worst case scenario, or you're watching TV and you see the news and you're like, oh my gosh, there, there are submarines and God knows where, and somebody's gonna kill us with missiles, and, and I don't know, we go all into that. And I remember how often the Lord would put in my heart when I was ministering to someone else telling me a story like that. And the Lord would show me his own heart, creating us in freedom and wanting us to choose him. But yet, as a father who is all powerful, has made us in such a way that he will never, ever, never negate our freedom to say yes to him. He will never force our yes. He will only invite. And he invites us. It's almost like he's made himself weak before human freedom. And we wonder, how can I survive when this child of mine is going to keep doing the wrong thing? Ask the Father's heart to be in yours. Ask Him, teach me how to love like you love. Because force is not freedom, and it's not love. It's the enemy that likes to manipulate and trick and force and, and cause fear. And Mary stood with her son. She stood, she stayed with him at the cross. But she knew, I am not suffering what he's suffering, but I am with him. She didn't, she didn't um, say, you have to hurt me like he's hurt. She let him live his suffering as he had to live it, but she was present. And there's a way to be present to our loved ones through prayer. And we're gonna talk more about that in the afternoon. So Mary's receptivity, Mary, Mary's presence is active. And she shows us that when we are with God, we can be at peace even as we stand and witness difficulties, sufferings, pains. Then the text tells us she saw that the wine ran out. They say the, ran, the wine ran short, but other translations say it ran out, so it must have just been awful. <laughs> Whatever it was. You can't wet it without wine. Right? So Mary realizes that, that there's a problem. She's perceptive. So she's in the situation, and because she's present to it, she can discern it. And many times when we're elsewhere, when we're locked up in, a, in places of worry, we can miss what God might be giving us or showing us or asking us to be part of his solution to the situation. Mary's able to discern it. And she catches that something's not right. My mom, we, when I was growing up, we, um, we were at a wedding shower and it was one of these Cajun things where everybody brought food. And my mom's, okay, so my mom's name is Ethel, and she's four foot eight. And she is like 100% Ethelness. Like if you look up Ethel in the dictionary, it's my mom. And we're walking past the tables, and we walk past the chicken salad, and she said, she always had a really strong sense of smell. She said, Tracy, I'm going to tell the ladies, this, this chicken salad is bad. <laughs> and I was like, Mom, are you sure? This like, it was this huge bowl that was supposed to feed everybody. And she like went, and she's like, you know, 
She goes and she's like, listen, y'all put that chicken salad out, but I can smell it and it's bad. And they didn't believe her. So they refused to take it away. And half the people that went to that party, it was not a pretty sight. <laughs> it's like what you would make a movie about, you know? But she perceived the problem. She saw, she saw the fly in the soup, right? But it's because she was able, she was present to the situation. Now, the reason I bring this up is that what do we do with problems? What do we do with difficulties? Mary, immediately following, the scripture tells us, when the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. She sees a problem, but she doesn't grasp the problem and try to fix it herself. What does she do? She goes to the one who can fix it. Ladies, it might seem like a spirit. it's all just spiritual, but to take our problems to the Lord first before anybody else is a day-to-day -day endeavor, moment-by-moment -moment endeavor. This is what intercession is, is to take what we have, what we're living, and bring it to God. Bring it to Him for His solution. Because this is the thing, when we start to process and we start to think, we start to try to figure out answers. What do we need to do? What should we say? What could he do? What would be the best thing? In a true intercession, opens the problem up to God and says, you talk to me about the problem. You open the door, and this means you have to carve out a space for listening to God's solution or proposal. You have to give God space to speak. How many times we pray, but we do all the talking, right? Because it's, I mean, I, I'm an outward thinker. I think with my mouth. <laughs> Poor Jesus. <laughs> But the Lord, in His mercy, has constantly invited me to become more and more willing to ask small questions and then to actually wait on the Lord for His response. And a little pro tip from a person who's been trying to pray for a while, he does answer. And sometimes we think what we're hearing is us. Or what we're, we think we're hearing is a distraction. I'll give you an example. I take the Lord to the Lord some situation. Some loved one who's kind of, you know, lived their life in such a way that it's just one turmoil after another. And they're in the latest turmoil. And in many ways, the next choices they make are whether or not they're going to survive or die. And so I take that to the Lord. When I bring it to Jesus, I tell him what's going on. And it's very easy for me to just keep talking. The challenge is to take part of the problem or the whole thing. And we start off this way. Jesus, teach me how to pray for my beloved one. From the get-go, I'm basically saying, Lord, I don't know how to pray. I'm a baby. Teach me how to pray. This is the prayer of the disciples. They went up to Jesus and they were like, teach us how to pray. 
Sometimes we think, oh, well, well, I guess I'm supposed to just kind of know. No, go to him and ask him. And then slowly begin to tell him what is troubling us the most. And ask him, how do you see it? And then listen. And maybe it's weird. Maybe a, a, a song that you haven't heard in years comes back to you. Or maybe you, you remember a scripture line. Or maybe um, something someone said comes to you. Or maybe it's just an inner word, like you hear a word or, or something comes. Chances are the Lord is speaking. Prayer is a dialogue. And it's a dialogue between persons. So if you've heard something, maybe it's not a distraction. Maybe you hear Stevie Nick singing some song and you're like, what? You know what? Ask the Lord. Is that for you? And then pray about it. Ask him about it. And wait for him to respond. And if he gives you a little something, talk to him about that. And it's hard. And this is where we need Mary's help because she's able to stand in the hard things. She's with us in the hard things. She's not afraid of our questions. The Lord is not afraid of our questions. And to take, if a scripture, or if we're looking at a scripture, take it line by line, sometimes word by word. And speak to the Lord about that. This is what prayer can be. Yes, there is a place for meditating on the mysteries of the rosary. Yes, there's a place for novenas where we're, you know, have something in front of us and we just basically are guided by those words. But what I'm speaking about is heart to heart communication. Where we give Jesus what it's like to be us right now. And in Genesis, when the Father has Adam and Eve in the garden, at the quiet of the day, he'd walk with them. The Father wants to walk with you. He wants to know, it's like, have coffee with me. Chat, let's chat, let's talk. Tell me, empty your heart to me. Bring your heart to the one who can restore it. So in a big way, Mary teaches us what intercession means. She encounters a problem and she brings it to Jesus. And being that she is the new Eve, Mary is writing, making right, what our first parents struggled with. Because if we think about what is she fixing, we can go back to Genesis 2, when God creates Adam and Eve, and he gives them the garden, and he tells Adam, friend, you can eat of all the vegetation, all the trees in the garden, but this one tree, you shall not, of that you shall not eat. So they have permission for everything and only one little prohibition. And Adam is also given two jobs, I like to say. He has to work the garden, make the garden bear fruit, but also guard the garden. Now to guard something means that you've got, you must be guarding it against something, some evil. That's Genesis 2. We get a glimpse of what he's guarding against in Genesis 3. 
Because what comes up in the garden in Genesis 3? It's a snake, right? The serpent. And he starts talking. Talking snakes are never good. <laughs> so the serpent goes and he speaks. And he says, did God really tell you not to eat of the tree? The very one thing that God is saying, for all we know, God wanted to give them the fruit of that tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but not yet. So God has put a prohibition on that tree. And it's that very tree that the serpent comes and starts asking, throwing doubtful light on the Father, saying, you thought you knew God was good, but I, think, I beg to differ. So he says, did God really tell you not to eat of that tree? Oh, but if you eat of that tree, you'll be like him. And he doesn't want that. Now, it's interesting. Um, Dr. Scott Hahn did a reflection on this passage, and he said something that really impressed me. He said, you know, when the serpent speaks, and he says, did God really tell you? The you is plural. So actually the serpent is saying, did God really tell y'all? He was Southern, I guess. Um, did God really tell y'all? So he's talking to two people. Do you remember, I know I'm asking you kind of a lot right now, but do you remember who responds when after the serpent speaks, who of the two responds? Who's talking to the serpent? Eve. Where was Adam? If he had two jobs, two jobs, and there's this serpent. Now, the word for serpent in that is Nahash. Nahash in Hebrew does not mean garden snake. I mean, we had, we had a garden when I was growing up, and we had snakes. And sometimes they got in the house, and I remember my mama killed a snake, it was a garden snake though, she killed it with a coat hanger and a can of rain. <laughs> I was like, Mama, you are beating that thing? And she's like, she's like the garden of the garden. She's like, not in my kitchen. <laughs> she was at it. This is not the scripture. Nahash actually is dragon. Dragon. So we got to give Adam a little credit that when he saw the serpent, he probably felt threatened. And not just of his physical life, but possibly everything he was. The one who could kill him physically, but could also kill him in the spirit, kill the life of God in him. So it seems to me that in a way, Adam put Eve to talk. You talk. Like, he's kind of behind it. I think of it this way. Like, when I was growing up, when, when we had we had a small house, and I remember it was 2 in the morning one night, and somebody, we were in the boonies, somebody's banging on the door, and my, I heard, like, we all, like, woke up, because to bang on a little wood frame house, it's like, everybody hears it. Do you think my dad turned to my mom and said, Ethel, <laughs> somebody's knocking on the door. You don't think you could go and check? <laughs> Heck no, daddy was up. He was getting his rifle before he got to the door, right? He had to protect the garden. So somehow Adam failed. against him. Because if he was a match for it, 
he could have said, you could have talked to my wife over my dead body. Right? But somehow he didn't. But it's not like he didn't know someone who was strong enough. Because remember, he walked with the Father, with the Creator, in the cool of the day. What I feel Adam failed to do was what we hear Mary did. She brought the problem to the one who could help. She spoke. She said something. Adam stayed silent. And that's the temptation. That we curl up in on ourselves and we try to fix problems on our own, with our own power. But I'll leave you with this. Adam was in the garden and he faced a death-dealing dragon. And he had no power to protect the bride. But just about three weeks ago, we were in Holy Week. And on Holy Thursday, we hear of the new Adam who's in a garden the night before he is to be ripped to shreds for us. And he faces the threat. He faces the death-dealing dragon who is, has so much hatred for the human person and I feel even more so for the woman that he says, you're going to come after my bride over my dead body. And he does die. He gives his life to absorb the death blow that is meant for us. So when we talk about going to God with our problems, of interceding as mothers and wives and sisters. It is no small thing. Because we know the one who defeats the dragon. Jesus Christ is the new Adam. And we are the bride. All of us. And I have the privilege of foregoing a marriage of this world to wear my wedding dress everywhere I go and remind people, you are the bride. He died for you. He took the brunt of every force that set up against us and he spoke the truth and he absorbed that power and he let it kill him. I remember reading a talk the other, the other day and he said, Jesus tricked Satan into killing him. And then he rose again. I'm like, woo woo. <laughs> I follow this account on, um, on Instagram. It's called Humans in New York. It's just a gentleman who goes around and takes pictures of people. And I usually don't read the stories. I just see the picture and I kind of flip past. But this one day I read the story. And to me, it illustrates exactly what we're up against and the power of speaking, of, of making expression, of saying to the Lord what's going on. And it was a young man, and he says this, seven years ago, I was sitting on the ledge of the 13th floor window of my apartment. I had tried to quit drinking so many times, but I could not do it. I had finally given up. My mind was racing through all the shameful things I had done, and I kept hearing this voice saying to me, jump, you piece of bleep. Jump, you piece of hmm. Over and over and over again. So I put my hands over my ears and I started rocking back and forth on the window ledge. And suddenly, I heard this small, still voice say a prayer, it said. And I didn't want to hear it. 
It was kind of like when your mother knocks on the door of your bedroom and you're doing something really bad. But then I heard it again, say a prayer. So I started to pray and I totally surrendered and then I felt an evil presence leave me. And I just kept saying, I can't believe you still love me. I can't believe you still love me. Then I cleaned up my room. I threw, I threw away all of my bag, bags of cocaine. I took a shower and then I went to work. Say a prayer. The invitation is to us in our freedom to turn to God and say, Houston, we have a problem. But I also reverence the fact that God is personal and he has things he wants to say. So we open the door today to be with God in this way. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a break till 10.30.